Kia ora koutou, ko Tiffany Taku Ingoa, he kairuruku taufainga aho ki Manaki Whenua. Good morning everyone, my name is Tiffany and I am the Events Coordinator at Manaki Whenua Landcare Research. Before I hand over to Hugh, I'm going to run through a couple of technical slides to ensure that your experience with us online today goes as smooth as possible. If you have joined us previously for a webinar session, you can ignore me for the next minute. You will notice you have a control panel at the side of your screen. If at any time this collapses, you can bring it back by simply clicking the orange arrow button. If you are having sound issues and you can see my mouth moving but cannot hear a word I'm saying, please grab the PDF in the handout section and this has instructions to resolve this quickly. The audio panel is where you can control where the sound plays on your computer. Select the drop down arrow and choose your audio output. During the presentation, you may have questions that you want to be covered in our Q&A session. You can do this via the chat panel throughout our session today. You will notice it is pretty small and it will be hard to read other attendees' questions. Simply select the pop-out icon on this panel and drag out the corner to make it as big as you want. You can also use this feature if you are having technical issues and ask me any questions. Questions asked by the audience show as anonymous and a green colour in the chat panel. However, please note we will use your name in the Q&A session. If I respond to you regarding a question, this will show as read. Now over to Hugh to introduce you to our first session for the Biosecurity Bonanza series. Cool, thank you very much, Tiffany, and um, welcome everybody to the first of our webinar series for the Biosecurity Bonanza. We've normally held these as a one day seminar, live seminar gathering somewhere in a region of New Zealand, but we've taken the opportunity to actually do a nationwide presentation. So I'm Hugh Gourlay, I have been uh, working in the biocontroller weeds uh, team for nearly 40 years now and I'm kind of the old guy around the place and probably the oldest actually in our team. Um, my role here is to facilitate this webinar and um, to handle a question and answer session at the end of Quentin's presentation. So I would now like to introduce to you Quentin Painter. Quint is based in Auckland and has recently become our expert on weeds of and working in the Pacific, specifically the Cook Islands. Take it away, Quint. Right, I think I'm showing my screen. So all being well, I will kick off um, and start with Kiora Kiorana, I suppose, from the Cook Islands. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, a weed biocontrol program um, in in Rarotonga. And if I can get this to work. Um, so the Cook Islands are a group of 15 islands, and they're based at, uh, ba basically in the middle of the South Pacific, uh, sandwiched between Samoa, Tonga, and French Polynesia. And Rarotonga is the largest, uh, most populous island and the most diverse in terms of flora. And most visitors uh, going to Rarotonga uh, head to the beach, um, which is not that surprising really, it's very nice. Um, but uh, the forest interior uh, is home to the most endemic species. And by that, I mean species which are only found in the Cook Islands, such as the uh, Kakarori flycatcher. And so these are species which if we lose them in the Cook Islands, we lose them uh, globally. And uh, the Cook Islands have major invasive weed problems. So there's a lot of different weed species. So uh, the same as New Zealand, the number of introduced plants actually outnumbers the number of native species. And they threaten endemic plant species. So one plant species, Acalypha wilderi, is already extinct. And nine other endemic plant species are critically endangered. Weeds also hinder agriculture. And also uh, smothering vines uh, cause deforestation in the forested watershed. Um, and this has been regarded as a, a potential risk to the island's hydrology and water supply. And so the theory is that uh, trees such as these get smothered in vines. And if the trees actually succumb and die, um, the roots of these trees are actually what's holding the soil together. And so the fear is that um, the soil will start to erode and wash away and you'll get landslips. And in fact, uh, the report that I've referred to here, the Matapi et al. Um, 
actually produced some remote sensing, which looked uh, very scary indeed, showing the area invaded by vines in red. Um, it's actually very difficult to go and ground truth uh, some of these uh, remote sensing images. Um, so I, I suspect they might be exaggerating the, the problem. Uh, but, you know, certainly you can see um, areas from a distance which are quite heavily smothered in vines. And if I zoom in a bit on that, um, you can see that things aren't quite right and there is definitely something uh, afoot. And so in 2012, we were funded by the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, which I'll refer to as MFAT from now on, um, to conduct a scoping study. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of different weeds out there. Um, so it's difficult to know exactly where to start. And there's also suites of weeds, uh, which means you've got the potential for replacement weeds. So in this image here, you can see uh, an invasive African tulip tree, and that's covered by invasive vines. So, of course, if you control the vines, you'll end up with a very happy and healthy African tulip tree. But if you only control the tulip tree, uh, you'll still be stuck with a big uh, mass of invasive vines. It's very difficult to wade your way through. And so um, to look at target weed prioritization, we had uh, a fairly major advantage in that the uh, Cook Island uh, biodiversity database uh, has a comprehensive listing of invasive species and it mentions that 46 out of the 333 naturalized exotic plants are considered to be uh, serious invaders. So in 2012 uh, we held a workshop in Rarotonga to rank those 46 seriously invasive plants and they were ranked uh, on weed importance because obviously we want to uh, target the most important weeds. Uh, the estimated cost of implementing biocontrol against each weed, because obviously there's a trade-off, um, might be better to target three cheaper targets than one really expensive one, for example. And we also took into account the likelihood that biocontrol would actually succeed. Um, doesn't matter how important a weed is, if your biocontrol program is likely to fail, uh, it's probably not worth investing in it. And so at the workshop, we um, categorized uh, each weed as high importance or medium importance or low importance. Um, and we asked 12 local experts um, to actually categorize the weeds for us. Uh, and these experts had interests in forestry, horticulture and livestock and biodiversity conservation and biosecurity. So although it wasn't perhaps the most scientific approach, um, when there was agreement among people with uh, such broad interests, then we were fairly confident that we were um, prioritizing the most important weeds and so yeah and, and basically they were scored with a pot potential maximum score of, of 120 points if all 12 people voted uh, high importance for any particular weed. And as I mentioned before to, to maximize cost effectiveness uh, you also need to work out how, co how costly it will be to implement biocontrol and for us that uh, work in biocontrol, it's uh, fairly uh, fairly easy to, to estimate the cost of a program in advance um, because some of the factors, particularly uh, looking at novel or repeat programs, uh, repeat programs are much, much cheaper than selecting a novel target because all the surveys in the native range of the weed to look for candidate biocontrol agents have been done and a lot of the host range testing will have already been done. So, so a repeat program is, is a lot cheaper than targeting a novel, novel target. And also when you are estimating the success of biocontrol, uh, for repeat programs, it's a fairly safe bet that if it was a past failure, then if you try again, it's likely to fail. But if it was a previous success in another country, uh, if you repeat that program, then you've got a very good chance of repeating that success. For novel programs, it's a lot harder to estimate the potential success or impact of biocontrol in advance. Uh, but there are a few little uh, uh, guides that we can take. Uh, based on correlations between plant traits and the likelihood of biocontrol impacts. Uh, so, for example, uh, clonal weeds are generally easier targets than weeds that reproduce sexually. And we think that's related to uh, genetic diversity. So if you have a biocontrol agent that can attack a particular clone, 
then there's no capacity for the weeds to develop resistance to that biocontrol agent. And then we just uh, totted up a, an overall score. So we had a nice impartial way of, of uh, prioritizing our weeds. So we basically added the important score to the biocontrol impact score and then took away the cost score. And so in November, 2013, uh, a weed biocontrol program began and that was funded by MFAT uh, Partnership Fund. And it was a partnership between Menaki Fenua Landcare Research and the Cook Islands Ministry of Agriculture. And we had some assistance from the Cook Islands Natural Heritage Trust. And we targeted the following weeds that, that were sort of um, prioritized as the, as the best targets using our prioritization scheme. And so these included cockleburr, uh, mile a minute weed, grand balloon vine, red passion fruit, African tulip tree, and strawberry guava. And I'll just go through these one at a time. So the first target we tackled was Xanthium pungens, also known as Xanthium strumerium, or cockleburr, or in Australia they call it Nagura burr. It's an annual cropping weed and it's native to North America. So I'll just have a look at my timer to see how I'm doing for time, except I couldn't get it to work. Um, and it's a repeat program. Uh, it was controlled by a rust fungus called Puccinia xanthii in Australia. And the host range of Puccinia xanthii was very well documented. So we knew um, that only one native Cook Island plant species uh, needed to be included in host specificity testing. Uh, we obtained the rust fungus from Australia and we did the host specificity testing on the native Cook Island plant, Melanthra biflora, and that was shown not to be a host. And so we proceeded with the release. And so Puccinia xanthii was released on two farms by the Cook Island Ministry of Agriculture in October 2016, and it subsequently spread throughout uh, Rarotonga. And uh, there's highly damaging outbreaks of the rust, especially after rain and especially in the cooler season. And you can see here, this is uh, very heavily infected leaves uh, growing next to some tomatoes. And farmers have reported that uh, they consider the plant to be much less of a problem now. So it's uh, looking very good indeed. And uh, yeah, I could just quickly point out that uh, that uh, Xanthium strumarium is also invasive in New Zealand and there's nothing, uh, no reason why we couldn't proceed with the biocontrol program here. On to the vines, and I'm going to treat all the vines together for uh, what will become very obvious. Um, on Rarotonga, the two main vines were Cardiospermum grandiflorum, uh, the grand balloon vine, which is the one here with these sort of uh, compound leaves. And uh, Mycania micrantha, often referred to as mile a minute weed because it grows so quickly. And uh, these two were the, the two main weeds on Rarotonga. And it was very obvious right from the start that um, if we only targeted one of them with biocontrol, then the other weed would just fill in the, fill in the gaps. So we had to tackle both of them. Uh, and a third vine was very commonly present as well, and that's red passion fruit. And so the fear was that if we were successful against mile a minute and grand balloon vine, uh, then we'd get replacement with red passion fruit. And in fact, on some of the outer islands uh, where grand balloon vine and mile a minute are absent, uh, red passion fruit is a seriously invasive vine. So the decision was made that we had to tackle all three. So the first of them was grand balloon vine. It comes from South America. And it's also invasive in South Africa. And we were quite lucky that they'd already begun work on candidate biocontrol agents in South Africa. And in fact, they'd worked on a rust fungus called Puccinia arachavalete, and found that it's very damaging and highly specific. Uh, we did conduct additional testing in Auckland on all three Cook Island native plants that are closely related to grand balloon vine. And so you can see here the general uh, approach is you get some balloon vine that's heavily infested and that's covered in pustules of the rust fungus and stick that to an agar dish and then just suspend it above your test plant here or a control plant here. Let the spores rain down and then come back in a few days and see whether your plants are infected or not. And uh, yes, our testing proved that the rust fungus was safe to release in Rarotonga. We released it in December 2017. 
and it spread like absolute wildfire. It was one of the most impressive uh, plant pathogens I've ever seen. Uh, it, it was found throughout Rarotonga within just three months. And you can see here that leaves covered in pustules just curling up and withering away. Um, even the uh, seed pods got covered and began to look very decorative. And the impact was devastating within a few months. And I'll, I'll come back to the impacts a bit later when I talk about all the vines together. So the next vine was Myla Minuteweed. And that's native to Central and South America. It was another repeat program, uh, a rust fungus from Ecuador called Puccinia spegazinii had already been released in the Pacific region in Fiji, uh, New Guinea and Vanuatu. Its host range was very well known. In fact, it's probably the most extensively tested biocontrol agent in the world. It's been tested against over 200 plant species. Uh, so we knew that no uh, further host testing was required. Uh, we got the rust fungus from Vanuatu and we shipped it to Rarotonga via our containment facility in Auckland. And in fact, all the agents we released in, in Rarotonga had to go through our containment facility first. And that was so that we could uh, ensure that what we were releasing in Rarotonga uh, was a pure culture of the agent, so we could clean up anything if required. And so the plan in, in Rarotonga was we'd, we'd bring in these plants that were infected and inoculate additional plants and then plant them out in the field. And the rust fungus against minor minute weed established in Rarotonga in 2017. They didn't spread anything, spread anything like as fast as the, the balloon vine rust, uh, but slowly and surely it's been spreading through Rarotonga. And again, causing very spectacular uh, impacts at certain times of the year, particularly after rain. So uh, the, the symptoms look like little yellow spots on the leaves from above, uh, but underneath the leaf, you can see these, these big pustules uh, with the with the spores all forming here. And you can see even on the stems, pustules forming. And once uh, minor minute weeds start getting pustules on the stem, uh, it gets very sick and withers away uh, very rapidly after infection. The third vine is red passion fruit. It's native to South America and the Caribbean. There are no native Passiflorace in the Cook Islands, but there are exotic Passiflora species which are grown for their fruit, especially Passiflora edulis. And uh, it's a novel top biocontrol target, so no one's ever tried to target red passion fruit before. So, uh, you know, when we considered this as a potential target for biocontrol, I was a little bit pessimistic because obviously a novel biocontrol target is very expensive to target. Uh, and very difficult to target when you know that there are uh, fungeneric plants that are extremely important. Uh, but there is quite a lot of uh, literature, particularly regarding Heliconius butterflies. Um, there's been a lot of research looking at co-evolution because Passiflora uh, are very poisonous plants and Heliconius butterflies uh, have managed to deal with the toxins and then incorporate them into their bodies and become distasteful. And the larvae of several of these Heliconius butterflies are known to only feed on plants in the subgenus Decaloba, which happens to be the subgenus that Passiflora rubra belongs to, uh, but they don't eat uh, edible Passiflora species, which belong to the subgenus Passiflora. So things were beginning to look uh, a little bit more promising. Uh, and in fact, Heliconius erato subspecies Serbia um, is, uh, only uses Passiflora rubra and a related uh, Passiflora punctata in the native range. So that was very promising indeed, except that it occurs in Ecuador. And we know from some of our previous biocontrol work, uh, particularly looking for potential uh, biocontrol agents for Pampas, uh, that getting permits to export anything from Ecuador is extremely difficult. So again, it looked like we were hitting another brick wall uh, until lo and behold, turns out there's a company in Ecuador called Heliconius Butterfly Works and that supplies butterflies to uh, butterfly houses all around the world. And we could just basically buy them off the shelf. So we wrote to them and said, well, can we buy some pupae? And they said, sure. Uh, we imported them into our containment facility, uh, did the host range testing and found that the larvae couldn't survive on, on edible passion fruit. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, we got the go ahead, released the butterfly in Rarotonga, and it's now very well established and very common. And so um, we, we did set up some uh, photo points at uh, release sites of the Grand Balloon fungus, uh, Puccinia arashavalete. 
And so I'll just show you what the cover looked like before biocontrol. And so at these particular sites, uh, given that they were balloon vine release, rust release sites, uh, balloon vine was the dominant vine, uh, almost 60% cover. Uh, but there was also Mycania present, uh, which at the time had about 15% cover. And there was uh, a very small amount of red passion fruit. Uh, so one year after we released, released the balloon vine rust, there was a huge decline in balloon vines, so about a better 90% decline. Uh, but as you can see, uh, Mycania actually benefited from that decline. So there was an increase in the percentage cover of Mycania within the first year. Um, but that's when the Mycania rust started to become common. And so the data we collected last year has shown that the Mycania has been knocked back down again. There has been an increase in red passion fruit but the percentage cover is still very low. So it's still round about 4%. Um, and I suspect that the butterfly has been fairly effective at stopping it from, from benefiting to any huge extent from the reduction in the other vines. And when you look at total vine cover overall, you can see that there has been a very big reduction in vines at those particular photo points from about 75% before the biocontrol agents were established to uh, around about 25% uh, at the last survey. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to continue this monitoring over time once international travel uh, opens up again. But to give you an idea of, of what it looks like, um, so on the left is a before photo and on the right is a, an after photo showing that uh, the vines are beginning to die back and the, the sort of nature of the forest is changing. And a similar view from a, for a different angle. Yep. Queen, Queen, if I can just interrupt, you've got about two minutes left, mate. All right. Thanks. Thanks. No worries. And yeah, so um, again, you can see that the nature of the forest has changed, uh, but there is a bit of an issue here that you, you can see some little red spots here, and uh, those are flowers of African tulip tree. And so although the vines have declined, the benefits uh, really depend on what was underneath those vines in the first place. So native plants have benefited, but also exotic plants have um, and crops have as well. But it just depends what was covered in the first place. Uh, and this is why we, we had to target a suite of vines. And so this is African tulip tree. Um, it's a large African tree and, it, and it's uh, invading the forested interior. And it, at the moment, it doesn't look too bad. You can see sort of patches of trees here or there or the odd individual tree. Uh, but when you go walking through the forest, uh, often you'll see the telltale uh, petals on the forest floor. So you know that you're underneath a big African tulip tree. And you can see seedlings all popping up in like a little halo around that uh, big tree. And what that tells me is that, you know, in a few decades time, that single tree will be a clump of trees. And over time, you know, things are only going to get worse and the African tulip tree will spread through the, the forest. So researchers from Rhodes University in South Africa have collected candidate agents in Ghana. Uh, and they've actually managed to get two agents approved for release in Rarotonga. The first one is an aerified mite. So those of you who are familiar with uh, the broom gall mite, it does very similar sort of damage of curling up the, the buds. Um, is well established in Rarotonga, uh, but the impacts to date are actually fairly minor. Um, we have a second agent that's approved for release, which is a leaf mining beetle. Uh, we hope to release it last month, but obviously uh, all the travel issues uh, associated with COVID-19 mean that uh, that's going to have to wait a while now. And the final agent we've looked at is Cidium cattleyanum or strawberry guava. It's a small South American tree. And it's a biocontrol target in Hawaii. They've already, already released a gall forming scale insect called Tectococcus ovatus. Uh, it's extremely host specific. It won't even go for cultivated uh, guavas. We knew that no further host range testing was necessary. Uh, we shipped them to Rarotonga in uh, August 2016 and transferred them to potted plants to grow up a culture. And from then on, we released them in the field. And it's established in the field, and uh, this is the kind of damage it causes. Um, when plants are very heavily infected, uh, it really does stunt them and cause uh, massive damage. Uh, but it's very slow to uh, to spread. Um, and just as an aside, strawberry guava is also invasive in New Zealand, uh, and it's a, an agent that we could uh, proceed with uh, for, for biocontrol here if necessary. So just to wrap up. Um, We've had rapid, really impressive impacts against cockleburr, grand balloon vine, and mile a minute. 
Uh, red passion fruit has increased slightly despite uh, the release of the Heliconius butterfly, but there's been an overall reduction in vine cover, which is benefiting both native plants and weeds and crops. The strawberry guava agent is spreading slowly, but it's potentially very damaging in the long term. But a second agent is needed for African tulip tree, and we hope to release that as soon as we can. And I think the project is on course to become a major success, and that's been helped, I think, by having local st stakeholders identify the most important weeds. Um, and that provided evidence that the project was needed and also pr provided that strategic selection of a suite of important weeds. Uh, it's difficult for me as an outsider to come in and, and fully grasp um, what the priorities are. So having, having local people uh, explain everything really did help and stopped us from making potentially one or two silly uh, decisions. Uh, the program had relatively low implementation costs because a lot of the programs uh, were repeat programs. And the unique opportunity with a novel program where we could just buy a, a butterfly off the shelf. And of course, there's been very helpful sharing of agents between agencies. And then a just a very, very quick look to the future. Uh, so MFAD is funding two new projects in the Pacific region, uh, one against pasture weeds in Vanuatu, and another against, uh, well, another biocontrolled weeds program to mitigate climate change in a range of, of countries throughout the Pacific. And hopefully work in Rarotonga will also continue so we can get that second agent for African tulip tree released. And that's the end of my talk. So I'll hand back to Hugh. Excellent, Quint. Thank you very much for that. It's um, never easy giving these uh, webinar talks, especially when the first time you do them, because you are sort of like talking to yourself rather than having an audience participation. But well done, Quint. Um, very interesting. Um, we've had uh, one question in particular um, from Suad Bujalis. I probably completely murdered that. My apologies. Um, how does the control you see for Mycania compare with that in PNG and um, Fiji and Vanuatu? Uh, I've, I actually haven't uh, been to Papua New Guinea um, to see the control there. Um, I have seen it in Vanuatu, and in Vanuatu the impacts look very impressive. Uh, I would say that the control in Rarotonga is approaching the levels I've seen in Vanuatu. It probably isn't quite there yet. Um, and the other thing I've noticed in the Cook Islands uh, is that the impacts are probably greater the further inland you go. Um, and I think that's probably just because of the humidity. So there's often a, a sort of breeze in the coastal areas. And a lot of the coastal infestations are sort of out in full sunshine, whereas in land, there's often a bit of shade associated with the infestations. And that really allows the, the rust fungus to get going. So I would say, yeah, there's a, a bit of a range of impacts. Inland, I would say that the Mycania has declined very dramatically, whereas in the coastal areas, not so much. Cool, okay, thank you. Um, another question from Annabelle Quibley. Uh, actually, it's a comment mostly, but very interesting to hear of your use of Heliconius for biocontrol. I used to work on wing pattern genomics in Heliconius, and we used to have huge struggles to find acceptable Passiflora species to keep different species happy when rearing them in Europe. So, so that was pretty cool. Great, um, thanks. And so Tony Robinson said, sorry, Quint, have to ask the cat's name. It starred in the background. <laughs> Someone <laughs> wanted to know the name of your cat, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's, it's called Magnus. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I didn't even so notice I it starring in the background. <laughs> No, you don't always, especially when you're concentrating on what you're doing. Um, I don't see any other particular um, questions. There are a few comments about a great presentation and things. Um, I think one of the things I um, was worth adding in is that uh, MFAT um, have actually funded uh, Manaki Fenualankia research for significantly greater work um, within the Pacific Islands. And we've now included, actually, Quint, you'll know the islands better. We've got Vanuatu. Um, and where else um fiji is no where else are we doing i think i had it on a previous slide so the marshall islands oh, Nui, tonga wallace and fortuna uh, there may be more than that actually i i, I sort of 
put that in as a very hurried last addition. <laughs> did I miss that? I apologise if I did. But, um, but yeah, so um, so we are doing a lot more work in that area as well. So. Sorry, Hugh, there um, is a, another question from Nick, if you just look at the bottom. Nick Charlton, okay. Yeah. Are there any other control methods being used at the same time? This is from Nick Charlton. Um, well, yeah, I think a lot of these weeds, particularly in, in uh, cropping situations, it's mainly manual control. Uh, so people were saying, for example, with Grand Balloon, uh, sorry, with Mile a Minute, um, it was a real issue uh, in pineapple plantations because you had to hand weed it, you couldn't spray it. Um, and hand weeding or slashing does appear to be the main uh, control use. Um, but herbicides are obviously used to a fair degree as well. So any, anything that we can do to reduce herbicide use is a, a, an added bonus. Because obviously the fear is that uh, any runoff into the lagoons uh, not going to help the coral reefs too much. Excellent. Right. Well, I think that was all of the questions. We haven't had any more come in. So, um, again, thank you very much for that, Quint. And um, thank you for those people who attended and um, got to watch. So, this has been recorded and will be available on our website, I think. Is that true, Tiffany? Uh, it will be um, in a few weeks, but also everyone will get a email with the link to watch the recording. So feel free to share that um, as well as people who couldn't quite make it today. They'll also be able to access that recording. Cool. Okay. Um, so we will wrap up now. So I will end the <laughs> webinar for everyone. Thank you so much for coming today and we look forward to seeing you again. Okay. Thanks very much.